Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 41, General Lafayette, Hero of Two Worlds. Before we get to our episode, I'd like to remind our listeners that we have a new YouTube page up for Generals and Napoleon where you can hear all of these episodes. So please check us out on YouTube when you get a minute. And now, on to the show. We have a very special guest for this episode. Uh, we have a fellow podcaster, Emmanuel Dubois, from the podcast Lafayette. We are here. Say hello, Emmanuel. Hello, John. Yeah, bonjour. <laughs> bonjour, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so I thought for this particular episode, we'd focus on one of the most famous generals, both in America and France, Lafayette. And uh, I was hoping my good friend Emmanuel will tell us all about this this interesting man. But before we get to that, can you tell us a bit about your podcast, Lafayette? We are here. What, what is it? What is that about? Yes. Yeah, so my podcast is the French history podcast for the American public by a Frenchman, me. <laughs> so I rebring a French perspective on France's history because I found that in America, especially, uh, there is a lot of interest for French history. Yep. But it often comes from the British point of view because you know we speak the same language <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, makes, it makes a lot of sense right uh but that means that you're often lacking the actual french point of view because it doesn't get translated or people will not look for those sources and me i was raised uh you know i was born in france even though i've been in canada for most of my life but you know i have a french upbringing and culture uh and i studied french history so that's why i'm trying to bring and the figure of Lafayette was chosen because he is, as we will discuss, that link between France and America. And it's a very rare and uh, almost unique link between two nations, as we will come to discuss. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to point out that France is our oldest ally in the United States. So, yeah. 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 I, I think it's interesting. And I think Lafayette's a very fascinating character, especially for the American Revolution and in the times of Napoleon. And uh, we'll kind of dive into him here. Um, he was born in September 1757 uh, in a South Central France province called, and I'll let you pronounce it. Yeah, it's Auvergne. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, his father was a colonel in a grenadier regiment. Was he born into an aristocratic family? Yes. Uh, so he's actually, it's a very old aristocratic family, uh, dating back from the 13th century, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I read like like some of his ancestors were even in the Crusades. Yeah, and uh, one of them was a Maréchal de France, a marshal. Yep. Um, there is also a famous, very famous writer, Madame de Lafayette, uh, who wrote uh, novels and plays, I believe, uh, a few decades or maybe a century before he was born. And so it's a very old, well-established French um a noble family and very well respected within the French kingdom. Okay. However, two years after his birth, his father's killed in a battle fighting the British in a, um, a battle in Westphalia. Um, this seems to tear his family apart, doesn't it? Cause his family or, or excuse me, his mother leaves for Paris kind of right after that. What, what kind of happens in his early years? Yeah, he had, um, he had not a troubled childhood because it was, you know, in comfort and everything. Um, and just before we go on, I just want to say his actual full name because it's actually sure, yeah. it's Marie Joseph Paul Yves Roch Gilbert du Motier, Marquis de Lafayette. Marquis de Lafayette is his title, is the he's going to become the Marquess Marquis in French of Lafayette right. when his father dies. Uh, and the rest is actually his name, but he would he would not say all of this, of course, each time you know, is these noble people love to give you five, six <laughs> first names. Uh, he would go by Gilbert du Motier, that is. Uh, what he would say, and he would present himself as the Marquis de Lafayette. So he's brought up as, you know, your av I mean, average French nobleman in the 1760s and 70s. That means he's going to be either a soldier or a clergyman. Uh, that's pretty much the two avenues that you could have as a young man in France if you were a nobleman. Right. Uh, and he chose the path of the soldier, just like his father before. 
And as you mentioned, his father died in Westphalia at the Battle of Minden. And that's the kind of leave a mark on the young Lafayette, because of course he's only two, but he will never know his father. Uh, but he knows that he died during a war against Britain. Uh, and that's going to have repercussions later in his life. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, after he moves to Paris in 1768, his mother dies two years later. Mm -hmm. It basically inherits the family estates at a very young age, 12 or 13. And what yes. I think is interesting is, you know, he, you know, as a 13-year-old, that's great, you inherit all his wealth. He could have just lived a life of luxury, but he chose not to. He chose to do something with his life. Yeah, he could have. And that's when you very early on, you can to see his very unique character. Uh, he will do everything you would not expect of somebody in his position. As you mentioned, in, he inherits a huge fortune. He's actually one of the richest men in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when his mother dies, his grandfather takes care of him and then he dies. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, you know, when you're a teenager, if you're not a complete idiot, when you have money, you consider, <laughs> you know, more or less autonomous you know they're, they're gonna right right and he's everything but an idiot uh he's also you know he starts training uh as a musketeer mm -hmm. uh musketeer like we say in french mm -hmm. uh so he's really you know he's giving he's getting good education train as an officer a soldier um he also marries very young uh at yeah. 16 or 17 which yeah. you know it's very common at the time sure uh with uh, marie de noailles Uh, and her family is also very rich, very distinguished, and very close to the French throne, actually, closer than mm -hmm. his. Uh, his family is more from what we call in, in France the province, the province, which mm -hmm. means outside of Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, Auvergne is quite far away from Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, she's closer to, to the capital, you know, and to the Versailles court. And during his upbringing and his teenage years, you know, they will try to make him a man of the court, a courtesan, but that's not just not him. He's mm -hmm. not one to dress up and go dancing in balls and go be <laughs> before uh, dukes and counts and go, your majesty. It's, that's just not him. Indeed. And it seems like he had a ha happy marriage from what I can read. He did, uh, even though it was an arranged marriage. Um, and to be honest, uh, during his life, he won't be always a, a faithful husband. But, you mm -hmm. know, uh, as I said, it's, That also is not uncommon at the time. Mm. They will still be together for a very long time until until her death, actually, and uh, she will die way before him. Um, and they had a good relationship, you know, uh, yeah. especially for, you know, in those nobles' families, it was not always the case. I recall you talked about, you know, the marshals of France and <laughs> of Napoleon and oh, their yeah. wives. It was not always, you know... <laughs> yeah, the happiest. Uh, steady. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he will do better. Um But I do think that as a, uh, even as a very young man, Lafayette was looking for a cause, a cause worth fighting for, uh, yeah. and even dying for. Uh, part of that, I think, is, is inheritance from in, uh, his family, you know, in the, in the moral sense, yeah, like his father died fighting for France. Uh, and I think he's looking uh, at an opportunity to do this. Um, and that's when you guys, <laughs> you Americans, guys. Uh, gave them, gave them, uh, gave him that opportunity. Yeah, I think this is interesting. Now we're still talking his teenage years, and he mm -hmm. learns about a growing revolt in America, and he decides, you know what, I, I want to go over there. I want to be part of this revolution. What do you think the appeal was, uh, other than the opportunity to fight the British? Yeah, of uh, the American so revolution. So that's a good point. If you want to get any Frenchman to do anything, ask him is going to be against the British. <laughs> <laughs> that's a unifying factor right there. <laughs> right, right. You know, right. but and it's actually, but you know, it sounds stupid, but it's actually a good point. You know, you the way he learns about America is that because in 1775 he is invited to a diner in Metz. Uh, Metz is uh, called M. -E, uh, it's written M E T Z. We call it. We say Metz. Yeah. Is in Lorraine, France, so northeastern France, uh, next to the German border. Mm -hmm. He's invited by a guy named the Comte de Breuil, and it's a diner in honor of the Duke of Gloucester. That man is the brother of King George III. Okay. Um, you know, they have those fancy diners, and because of his family and his wife's family, he's invited to that diner. Is it? And he's only 17 years old. Right. And the Duke 
keeps talking about those damn American insurgents, <laughs> as he <laughs> called them, um, because in 1775, you know, it's you don't have the, the Declaration of Independence yet, but, you know, trouble is starting to stir quite firmly. Correct. Um, and hearing about this from that very petulant man, he's like, I'm going to join this guy. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I'm, a, I'm exaggerating a bit, but he, it's, it triggers something in him. I think he, he thought your cause was good, and yeah. he recognized that the Americans had a point. You yeah. know, if we want to be independent, let us. Uh, yeah. We're we're on, on country now, right? And, yeah. and it's funny because his, you know, uh, the Americans fought the French just twenty years before as part of the British Empire. You know. Yeah, but there's there's a lot of uh, you know new ideals out about democracy. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah, I mean, in the sense, he's very influenced by the Lumière, you know, the French Enlightenment. Uh, yeah. That's obvious. Uh, Rousseau and other French thinkers who believed in, you know, self-determination, in liberty, uh, individual freedom, uh, is very influenced by that. But the thing is, he's one of those few people who's going to put his money where his mouth is. Uh, mm -hmm. He's going to fight for it. He's going to risk his life. He's going to get wounded. Uh, he's going to get imprisoned. He's, you know, he's going to really put his life on the line for these ideals more than most philosophers or noblemen or soldiers. You know, he's going to, and he's going to be true to that his whole life uh, to the very end. Uh, and that starts, you know, when he's 17 years old. Um, so he, he will, you know, and, um, and he has a very adventurous temper. Uh, you know, he doesn't fear risk. Yeah. And as you said, he's independent financially, so he can do yeah. whatever the heck he wants. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to point out too, that, you know, he's not the only Frenchman thinking this, the French government hopes that, by supplying the Americans with guns, equipment, and troops, they might restore French influence and territory lost in the French and Indian War. Yeah, and so that, young that was a major blow. Yeah, indeed, that was a, a huge loss for France. And so young Lafayette insists upon being part of the French expedition. He becomes a major general despite his age, which is incredible. And I think the other part is, like you were saying before, he can, he's able to finance himself. He learns that the U.S. government can't finance his voyage, so he buys his own ship and arrives in South Carolina in 1777. This is a 20-year-old man. I, it's just, it's almost impossible. Yeah, and he didn't even speak English. <laughs> he learned yeah. it on the boat, uh, yeah. and then he perfected it uh, when he when he comes to America. Yeah. And what I like also is that, you know, um, but the funny thing, even though the, the French government is all too happy to help, uh, um, you know, uh, Viennuisans to the British, Right. They're still not at war with England at that point. Right. So technically, what Lafayette is doing is illegal. Uh, he's, he's not supposed to go to America at that point. He's, mm -hmm. We're not supposed to send actual soldiers in the French army yet <laughs> uh, right. in America. And I so, read that. The king didn't so approve this. Yeah. The king did not. And it's actually, you know, there is a, uh, he, he should be arrested. Right. And actually, when he will come back to France, he will be arrested. But as we'll see, it's going to be more for form than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and so he could be arrested by the French or the English. And he still manages to go all the way to America. And so, he arrives, as you mentioned, in 1777, close to Georgetown. Um, and he will be quite quickly presented or introduced to George Washington. Yeah. Does he, uh, does he bond well with the commander in chief, George Washington? I would say more than well. Uh, they become friends pretty quickly, uh, and they're going to be very close friends for the remaining uh, years of George Washington's life. Uh, I think there is kind of a father-son relationship there. Uh, you know, yeah. there are twenty years difference. Uh, the fact that Lafayette never really had the, a father, um, and Washington is very impressed by him. Uh, you know, uh, he's made, uh, as you mentioned, he's made a major general and. Mm -hmm. He sees that young man is brilliant, he's competent, you know, he's yeah. a good soldier. He sees that he can bring, I mean, he's a good soldier. And the French soldiers, um, you know, they had a good training. Yeah. And they're trained to fight against whom exactly? <laughs> the British. <laughs> the British. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a good, um, it's a yeah. good addition to the Continental Army. You make a good point there because he knows British tactics because he's been he's been trained to fight against that. Yeah, and the French knew that a war was coming with uh, Britain. You know, at that point, it's not if it's when. <laughs> and right. during the 17th, 18th centuries, just they were just fighting each other all the time. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, this young lad is uh, put in charge of American troops. Uh, he fights his first battle is at Brandywine at yep. the end of seventy seven. He's wounded, yep. you know, yep. bullet to the leg, you know, not not nothing. Nothing serious. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, but still takes him a few weeks to recover. And again, you know, fights in Monmouth. Um, he proves a very able commander. A Congress congratulates him. Uh, so from the get-go, he has quite a um, reputation and a good career uh, as part of the Continental Army. Yeah, and I, I, he uh, after the Battle of Gloucester, uh, he beats a Hessian force in the pay of the British at Gloucester. Mm -hmm. And he says something interesting, which I, I thought was very, I've never heard a general say, and he tells Washington, I'm here to learn not to teach. <laughs> yeah, that was a quote, and I think he, I'm trying to figure out what he meant by that. Is he, even though he's a young man, he still wants to learn. He's not trying to, He's not trying to be General Washington and be all important. Like, I think he's trying to learn as he's a general, which I think is interesting. Yeah, I think he always knew his place. Uh, mm -hmm. He always know, and he never drove for power. Uh, that's something we're going to see during the French Revolution a lot. You know, he could, he, at some point, he could have been head of government. Right. He never tried to be. Uh, he, with the prestige that he will have, everything, he could have been easily. And he will never even try. Uh, that's just not the person he is. He wants to do what's good in his eyes, and that's not him becoming the, the big boss, if you will. Yeah, he had no political aspirations. No, yeah. and I think that's part of the reason why Washington loved him so much, because he recognized that in that man. He was not, you know, a potential uh, competitor. Uh, mm -hmm. He was going to serve the cause more than mm -hmm. anything else. And yeah, quick, quick note, uh, do you know the, um, the name of uh, Lafayette's son? Uh, is it George? Is George Washington actually? He gave the <laughs> both name George Washington in honor of his friend. I did. I, you know, I think I did read that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, yeah. That's that's quite an honor to name your son after. Um, yeah, basically your mentor there. That's very yeah, pretty much. I, I think he learned a lot uh, with George Washington. And they were often, you know, when they were not together, they were exchanging letters all the time. Yeah. So they have a very good working relationship. But as I said, they they did became uh, become true true friends. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily and distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast on Spotify and everywhere else, podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. He performs well in the battles of 1778, but he returns to France in 1779. Is, is that because he was worn out, or was he trying to bring um, more French troops and influence to America? Why do you think he returned to France at that time? It's more uh, because he wants to persuade the French government of uh, direct intervention in America. Uh, he because he wants to have the cause right so in his in his view uh the best way to do that is to bring the french army and navy into the combat right uh so when he arrives it's a funny thing because when he gets back to france he's greeted as a hero but mm -hmm. since he disobeyed the king two years before he is condemned to 10 days of house arrest mm -hmm. <laughs> you know <laughs> basically uh you know uh or in our period <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah so you know get some rest and we'll start over okay fine <laughs> um and he will contribute to uh making france uh, to involving france in the war yeah. uh and at that point you know france as a country has recovered from the uh seven years war militarily they actually rebuilt the fleet uh yeah. completely so they have a very modern fleet mm -hmm. and uh, one that can actually compete with the Royal Navy. And he will also convince uh, the French government, I mean, the king in his foreign ministry, to send more men than they initially thought they should send. Uh, so when he comes back to France, to, I mean, to the US, it's with 6,000 troops, which is yeah. quite a lot. Uh, 6,000 yeah. professional soldiers. Yeah. Uh, I, I read in 1780, he gets back to Boston and he's greeted with a lot of enthusiasm. It almost seems like he's a celebrity at this point. He, he starts he starts to become one. Yeah. I would say he's not, uh, I mean, he's, he's very well known, but his legend is growing, you know. Uh, yeah. And he manages to be the bridge between the two countries, along with people like uh, Benjamin Franklin. 
you have to realize that at the time, France and Great Britain are the two superpowers. Uh, no other nation state is even close to them. Correct. So when France gets involved in the conflict, it's a big, big deal. You know, it's a mm-hmm. very big deal. Um, and like the Seven Years' War before that was almost a world war. I mean, you had yeah, com- you you had combat in Europe, in America, in yeah. Asia, on the oh, oceans. You know, it's it's huge. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, and and, and I, you know, I don't want to knock all out the other French con- contrib- contributors. You know, Rochambeau and mm-hmm. uh, many. Uh, you know, Marshal Berthier. He served in America, so yes. you know, it, there there was a lot of uh, French involvement in America at the time. Uh, in 1781, the Lafayette assisted Washington in the Yorktown campaign, mm-hmm. uh, leading to the eventual British capitulation. What do you think his contributions overall were to the American war effort? Well, I think as a leading officer, he's one, he, was, he was one of the officers that Washington knew he could count on all the time. Uh, he was one of those men you could send in pretty much any situation, and you know that he will take the right decisions. Um, he, he was a good uh, man leader, uh, and he, he knew how to analyze uh, tactical situation. So, mm-hmm. as purely military man, he was very important. You know, you wanted him in your army, right. um, and also he still was that link between the two countries. Even though you have, as you said, Rochambeau, uh, Berthier, or you have the Admiral Destin, you know, um, yep. who is leading the French fleet, yep. all they all play a role. But Lafayette is the unifying figure, if you will. Mm-hmm. between those two and Lafayette is the the other man involved in this all there because you know their king told them to go right and Lafayette is there because he wants America to win this he wants America to be uh, independent he wants mm-hmm. to make his point and he wants your republic to establish itself because mm-hmm. he, the American republic was established with ideals he believed in uh, and he and at the time, it was it had never been done. And the American Republic is a social experiment, really, you know, with all these ideas of equality, uh, the the American, you know, Declaration of Independence, and then your Constitution. All those ideas are very close to the French Enlightenment, mm-hmm. but they've never been put into practice yet. Uh, yeah. And he sees that as an opportunity to do that. Uh, and then you will have, uh, you know, a bit later, the French Revolution was going to be uh, uh, strike two of that yeah, agenda. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Um, you know, a few years later, after America wins its independence, you know, Lafayette finds himself in the middle of another revolution, this time in his home country. What was his role during this chaotic time with, you know, King Louis XVI is deposed and beheaded? What, how is Lafayette navigating this time? Because, I mean, it was a dangerous time to be an aristocrat and rich in France. Yeah, very dangerous, actually. Um, what Lafayette, you know, even before the revolution actually starts, uh, he's trying to help uh, solve the situation because he he knows it's coming. I mean, maybe not in the form that it took, but it, he knows that the country is in a bad shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, the French have the American during the war, but that cost them pretty much all the money they had. <laughs> right, right. It was a very expensive war uh, in a country that was actually with big financial difficulties. So it's kind of the last straw financially. And then you have all the French societal structure, which is about to collapse anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and Lafayette wants to modernize people, uh, the, modernize, I mean, the, soci- the French society. So, for example, uh, in 17, uh, 1787, there is a nobleman assembly in France to try to bring some ideas uh, to solve some issues. Mm-hmm. And he's advancing ideas of freedom, equality, and to hereditary privileges, even though he, you know, he got his position because of them, but he wants to get rid of those. Uh, and his ideas are completely ignored. Uh, yeah. When you have the Estates General, which is w- w- uh, basically the, the French king is summoning the French nobles, clergymen, and the, and the commoners, yeah. uh, in May 1789, he is an elected representative uh, mm-hmm. and is putting forward the same ideas. So when the revolution erupts in July 1789, uh, Lafayette embraces it. Uh, he doesn't want to kill the king. The, right. the, you know, the, that that will take more time, and he w- he will never be for that. But he wants change. He wants France to become a more egalitarian society. Right. So because of his prestige and military experience, right from the get-go, he's named commander of the newly formed French National Guard. Mm-hmm. And the first thing he does is to destroy the Bastille fortress. You know the famous prison. 
yeah. uh, which had been taken by the revolutionaries on July 14th. Yep. Uh, and he, he destroys it because he understands that it's a symbol of monarchy, mm-hmm. of uh, monarchic oppression. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also creates the tricolor cockade for his troops. And that those cars are blue, white, and red. Red. Blue and red being the colors of the city of Paris and white being the color of the monarchy. And mm-hmm. you have these together and that makes the f- current French flag. So Lafayette created the French flag. Right. Um, and he also very quickly has a hand in the writing of the Déclaration Universelle des Droits de l'Homme et du Citoyen, the mm-hmm. Universal Declaration of the Rights of Men and of the Citizen, which is a pillar document in French, and you could say even world history, correct? Uh, to declare uh, rights for everybody, is one of the writers. But it won't last very long, though, because the French Revolution very quickly turns into a very violent affair. <laughs> yeah, more more of a power struggle than really a freedom uh, fighting fighting against tyranny. Uh, you have political factions that show up and. Lafayette is not a politician, uh, so he very quickly loses political power, uh, is pushed aside by more extremist revolutionaries, and the last blow comes in June 1781, when the French king Louis XVI flees during the night, along with his family, and um, even though he's caught and arrested in a city called uh, Varennes, that's why we called it the flight to Varennes, yep. um, even though he was not going to Varennes, he was just passing through, but that's where they caught him, the problem is that Lafayette was in charge of the king's security. Uh, mm. so you know it looked bad on him um, the, some people even accused him of having helped the king but never did that but you know it l- just looked bad right. uh, and I think they just wanted to get rid of him because he was not an extremist he wanted a constitutional monarchy he didn't want a republic not at the beginning anyway he basically wanted a, a country with good law and order and laws made to represent the people uh, with you know uh, in a modern way, just like the Americans has uh, done. It didn't, didn't have to be a republic. It had to be a good equatorian society. Right. Um, so he, he resigns in 1791. He retreats to his land in Auvergne. Uh, but he's very soon called back because the next year, you know, basically the whole of Europe declares war on France, uh, uh, especially when we remove the king from power, establish yeah. the republic, and that triggers... Uh, the con- pretty much everybody declares declare war on France because they want to restore the old power. They're fear. They're they're freeing what is happening in France. Right. And so he's he joins the army uh, to defend the country against pretty much everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he still don't want the king to be you know killed, even though it's not done yet. Right. Um, and you have a lot of Frenchmen turning against each other at that point. You know, it's the it's before what we call the terror, but it's getting close to there uh and he decides that he should leave france yeah uh and it's a, so it's a sad moment he has to flee his home country yeah uh completely he he he's that's the funny thing he's labeled a traitor by the french revolutionaries but he's labeled a revolutionary by everybody else <laughs> right, right. so when he crosses the border he's arrested by austrian troops um and that's when he's sent to prison for five years. For, quote, foment- fomenting rebellions, end quote. Yeah, exactly. And it sounds a bit extreme. Uh, five years? I mean, that seems like a long time. It is. Uh, basically, it was com- condemned to, for a lifetime. Uh, yeah. And that's not until a certain uh, Corsican general comes around <laughs> <laughs> that he w- will be freed. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, you know, obviously, the reign of terror kind of flames out. Uh, the directory government comes in and Napoleon is a general for the directory government. He's not running the government just yet. But mm-hmm. then in 1800, he is he's made his coup. He's uh, first council and Napoleon helps secure his freedom. Yeah, it's actually during when they did the treaty of uh, Campo Formio uh, in October 1797 after That's the right. campaign of Italy. That's right. Uh, one of the demands of Napoleon in France uh, are that Lafayette should be uh, freed. And it's mm-hmm. granted, you know, at that point, the Austrian, <laughs> it's not like they have much to say. Um, so he's freed by Napoleon, or I would should say by the treaty that he signs. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think that Napoleon at this point, you know, Napoleon is younger than him. Um, and he's still just, as you said, just a general, even though he's having, he's signing treaties without approval of, <laughs> of yeah, the government. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, 
he doesn't know Lafayette really personally that I think maybe he met him once, but he, they all need know each other. And yeah. he might have liked to have uh, that man with him, right. but it won't happen because two years after that, uh, Napoleon takes power, as you said, during the 18 Brumaire, 18 Brumaire coup. Yep. And uh, Lafayette denounces that. Uh, and then he refuses the post of ambassador to the United States and he will again retire on his lands in Auvergne. He, he just won't serve Napoleon because he considers him a despot. Uh, he considers that he's destroying the revolution and that he's not much better than the kings uh, right. before him. Um, but you think, Nap- you think he'd be a little appreciative because Napoleon got him out of, out of prison, you know? It, That's it, true, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't. I like. I get it. Like he has Republican principles, and Napoleon was an autocrat and a dictator. But you think he'd be all right? Well, you know, Napoleon's better than the Reign of Terror or the Directory. Mm. Maybe I should just go along with it. But you're right. That's just not his way. That's just not his way. He, he just won't serve a regime he doesn't believe in. That's not him. Uh, he just won't do that. And we'll see that even after Napoleon was gone, uh, Lafayette will hold true to, to these ideals. Um, so he doesn't care who Napoleon is and what he's accomplishing. I mean, I'm sure he respected the man and the military genius that he was, because as a military man himself, he could recognize that, um, you know, and appreciate it. But he won't serve somebody that he doesn't like, basically. Um, and that's what happened. So basically, during the whole empire period, I mean, during the consulate and the empire, um, Lafayette doesn't do much. But his voice passes in 1807, yes. and I think that really... That really hurts him, and he kind of withdraws from public life. Yeah, for some time he does, and actually he retries until 1815. Um, so because when Napoleon comes back during the Hundred Days, uh, for that for a small amount of time, Lafayette actually supports him. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a few reasons, um, and it's not always clear why. But my analysis is that I think he believes Napoleon when he says that he wants to reform France. To make mm-hmm. it more democratic, you know. And I think Lafayette is like, okay, le- maybe there is a chance here. Mm-hmm. Um, and he or actually wants to help that happen. And he becomes actually a representative in the assembly, even uh, as the deputy of uh, Seine-et-Marne. And mm-hmm. he's even chosen uh, as vice president of that assembly. So, you know, he ha- he's playing a role. Mm-hmm. But after Waterloo, uh, he basically ditches uh, Napoleon. He's like, okay, uh, we're done with that, with that <laughs> man. I think like many people, he just wanted France to have peace. You know, at that point, the country has been at war for over 20 years. Right. Um, it's just and, not sustainable. Yeah. And he probably lost a lot of uh, military friends in the wars and, and, and just France in general, like you said, was in, in shambles. So he just mm. probably wanted to have uh, stability at that point. Yeah. Yep. Um, and the funny thing, though, is that the Bourbon monarchy is restored with King Louis XVIII, who is mm-hmm. Louis XVI's brother. Uh, because the, his son died um, mm. in 1795. Um, and Lafayette is very wary of that new king. Uh, mm. He thinks he won't respect the French constitution, just like he did in 1814. I mean, Louis XVIII is really not a great king. Mm-hmm. Um, he thinks that he will try to retake some of the old days power. And indeed, Louis XVIII tries to. In, he does find Lafayette on his way, though. Uh, right. Lafayette is elected in Sartre as a representative in 1818, and he keeps doing, fighting the same fight for individual liberties. He opposes all power, uh, abuse of power by the king. Uh, he's defeated in an election in 1824, and that's when he goes back to the States right. um, for a year or so. Uh, and he's granted a hero's welcome. You know, the, the Americans just can't get enough of him. They, they oh, yeah, love him. Uh, yep. uh, he, I think he did a whole uh, circuit there that you can still make. Uh, yeah, there's like the Lafayette Trail. I yeah, yeah. Like tour you can do. Yeah, yeah. That's so right. you can go where you want. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, they're just very happy to have him again. You know, uh, almost 30 years after, uh, over 30 years after the war. Um, yeah. And he returns to France and is elected again in 1827. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that in France is about to have other uh, trouble. Um, Louis XVIII died in 1824 and Charles X becomes king. Right. And Charles X uh, is an even worse king. He removes <laughs> lots of civil liberties, right. uh, abolishes the liberty of the press, and, you know, it just goes on and on and on. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And you have this in the other factors in Europe that causes the 1830 revolution. Right. It's not as big as the 1789 one, but it's big enough that the you know it's gonna um out the king, <laughs> you know. Right, right. Um, and Lafayette plays a role in this uh, during what we call the Trois Glorieuses, which means the three glorious days yep. in the reaction of 1830. That's what you actually see in uh, Les Miserables uh, of Victor Hugo, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's that's that revolution, not the one before everybody. I, I mean, I know a lot of people in America that think it's the first French revolution. Nope. Les Miserables is during 1830. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, and uh, Marmont cannot put down the revolution and the king has to uh, flee the country. Yeah, he has to flee. Uh, so um, so he's named, Lafayette is again named uh, commander of the National Guard again, and he leads the Duke of Orléans to the city hall of Paris. Uh, and that man is going to be the next king, Louis Philippe. Yep. Um, so yeah, as we mentioned, Charles X is overthrown, has to flee. And that new French government is nicknamed the July Monarchy because it all happened in, in July, July 1830. Um, and the funny thing is, some insurrectionists, they want to reestablish the Republic. They don't want another king. And guess who they chose as president? Mm. They wanted Lafayette to be president. <laughs> of course. Uh, and Lafayette at that time is 72. Right. And 72 in 1830 is like, I don't know, 96 today you know it's especially for a man like him that's been fighting and right. in prison you know i can imagine i mean the guy was strong um but lafayette as we said that's just not his way he doesn't uh he, his drive is not power it's yeah. justice more than anything else yeah uh so he wants a constitutional monarchy uh and also maybe he was a bit tired too i mean as i said he's 72 for god's sake <laughs> uh and he, he is elected in the new government right? and he keeps fighting the same fights. You know, each yeah. time he sees an abuse of power, he opposes it in France and even outside of France. I think he supported some causes in Poland and Spain. Uh, you know, he was very present over Europe yeah. and he will eventually die of pneumonia um, in 1834, age 76. Right. And when he dies, um, he's granted the same funeral honors by American Congress as they did George Washington. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you brought that up. What do you think his legacy is both in America and France and, I guess, overall? I, I think, first, you know, for the two countries, uh, France and America, they have um, an history together that is hard to find another example of. Um, let me... Let me go back to an, to an example. Um, on July 4th, 1917, uh, U.S. Army Colonel Charles uh, Stanton made a speech at the Picpus Cemetery in France, where the Marquis de Lafayette is buried. Mm -hmm. uh, America just had joined the Allied cause in World War I right. alongside France and Great Britain. And Stanton's speech, who, the, who was uh, approved by General Pershing, uh, was concluded by this little paragraph. He said, uh, quote, America has joined forces with the Allied powers, and what we have of blood and treasure are yours. Therefore, it is with loving pride that we drape the colors in tribute of respect to the citizen of your great republic. And here and now, in the shadow of the illustrious dead, we pledge our heart and our honor in carrying this war to a successful issue. Lafayette, we are here. So mm. that colonel was honoring Lafayette almost, you know, 150 years after uh, he went to America. Yeah, and, um, and that's the name of your podcast. There you go. That's where I took it from. You know, the sentence was pronounced by that man. That's amazing. Because he, he established that link between the two countries. There is a very strong symbol of friendship born through hard times and that common values are more important than nationalities. Um, and Lafayette held true to these values his whole life. And it's not that common, especially with someone involved in politics. You know, you could call him stubborn even, you know. Um, he just but, held true to that his whole life. But did and, he learn how to be a, a politician? Because it seems like he he never learned how to compromise his values. Like, And I, I know that's the goal of being a diplomat and a politician. Sometimes you have to compromise. It that's seems like true. He never really, 
maybe he he learned how to do it but he never wanted to do it yeah he never wanted to do it and he never he's never a true politician in that sense because as you said he doesn't compromise like napoleon will compromise during his life especially at the beginning like in the consulate yep. um he he won't uh that's just not the man he is and that's maybe why he never rose that high in terms of uh, political life uh, never be really above a uh, representative. It does just not the man he was. And I think in America, you see him as that war hero, the man that helped you become independent. In France, we know about this and we uh, it's very important in his legacy. The role that he, for a long time, the role that he played in the, uh, the French Revolution was, how can I put it, a gray area uh, because the French Revolution is so complex. Yeah, there's and a lot parts in a lot of gray area like you said yeah. yeah and and it was so violent and it and still today you know in france you have people who claim to be uh who have any claim to have inherited the french revolution ideals like completely mm -hmm. uh you know almost jacobin people you know uh, poor right. to the people to the max you know almost no government and what have you or very very you know you, you would say left wing maybe and then you have French people that are very traditional, it's almost monarchist. You have even monarchist people in France uh, right. to this day. And like, for example, the power that we have now in France is a compromise between the two because it is a republic, uh, yeah. it's a democracy, but the French president is very powerful, is, uh, is more powerful than most uh, head of states in the, right. in the world. So it is that balance between France wanting to be a strong country with a strong government and yet having the people have their say that's very interesting i i learned so much in our, our our chat right there about lafayette that i didn't know both his influence on america and france and, and the world in general i i really appreciate that um before we go Manuel, i, I do want to talk about your podcast one more time lafayette we are here uh and you also have a twitter page right yeah um so you can find the the podcast on whatever platform you listen podcast on uh, mm -hmm. or on lafayettepodcast.com uh, as for the twitter uh, twitter page it's at lafayette pod um, you have also all the links on uh, on the web page uh, including you know if you prefer to follow me on reddit or instagram what have you but my main um, social media is, uh, is uh, twitter and i do uh, one episode a month and i do on any subject like i did a couple episodes on our friend napoleon Yep. I did one on the French Revolution. My last one is on the French uh, defeat of 1940, the fall of France. I guess. Yeah, but... World War II. I, I just listened to that. It was really good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you very much again, John. I really appreciate the opportunity and we'll talk soon. All right, Manuel. Thanks for your time.